This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 164 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams, and over there on the this other is, end, Doc Goldstein. This is Doc. This is Doc here. Hello. <laughs> How's things, mate? Things are really good. Happy things Easter, good. by the way. Yes, yes, yes. Tomorrow's <laughs> Easter Sunday. It's already Sunday where you are, right? That is correct. <laughs> Oh, okay. But I have a 16-year-old son, so he's still sound asleep, even though it's 9.30 on Sunday morning. <laughs> so I can easily record a podcast for 45 minutes and uh, and not have any fear that he'll be awake and waiting for me to uh, hand out Easter eggs. <laughs> well, my grandson's running around, and he may come in and make some noise, but oh, okay. he doesn't really get Easter-y. It's pretty young to get Easter, so it doesn't How old matter. is he? He's four. Right, Okay. He'd be, he'd be just about hitting that sweet spot, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows who Santa Claus is, so yeah, yeah. You, you betcha. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, we were going to make this episode all about stereo miking techniques, but I got thrown a bit of a curveball through the week at work, and that prevented me from recording some samples, which I felt was kind of a necessity. If we were going to do an episode about stereo miking techniques, it would make perfect sense to record some samples using the various stereo miking techniques, given that this is an audio-only podcast. But yeah, I got thrown a bit of a curveball, which you know completely stopped me from any designs I might have had on doing that. Okay, a little bit of backstory. At the radio network where I work, within our building, we have a suite of audio production studios. There are three control rooms and three voice booths. And I've actually drawn a graphic. I'll I'll post it in the show notes if anyone wants to see it. But imagine this if you can. Control room one has line of sight to voice booth one. Control room two, which is my control or has been my control room for the last nine years, has line of sight to voice booth one and voice booth two, and then control room three, which has been sitting vacant for the last 15 months, has line of sight to voice booth two and voice booth three. Now, there's a girl, Leah, who works in voice booth three, which has for a couple of years been converted into an editing suite. Now, the problem with her workflow is that when she has to record voices, they have to be in the same room as her, and she has to turn her monitors down and put headphones on and that's just a crazy way of having to work as an engineer control room three the one that's been sitting vacant for 15 months is the only control room which has a multi-core snake that runs into voice booth two and that's where we record any acoustic sessions for artists who come in you know to do an acoustic performance and About 12 months ago, I put my hand up to say, look, I'll look after the acoustic performances because I've, A, had experience doing it, and B, I really enjoy it. And no one else in the building has experience nor has an interest in doing it. So from a business point of view, it totally made sense that I should be the guy that handles those acoustic recordings. But it means walking out of my control room control room two across the hall and into control room three in order to do those acoustic sessions when they happen so i argued to my boss about oh eight ten months ago i said mate why don't you move me out of my control room into control room three and then move leah into my room and then that way she's got access to both voice booth one and two so you know Anytime she needs to record a voice, she can at least do it properly with, you know, listening on speakers and having her voice talent in an isolated booth because she has line of sight to, you know, or would then have line of sight to both voice booth one and voice booth two. So I'd thrown that idea out there and didn't think that anything was happening with it. We have also been threatened for about three years that at some point we were going to get Max and we were going to get Pro Tools. And as I've you know, said often, I, I'm not a huge fan of Pro Tools. I think it drags its heels on a lot of uh, respects. But um, that... Hey. Yeah, hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can get to that argument. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, 
Leah is currently uh, pregnant and will be going off on maternity leave in about uh, uh, seven or eight weeks' time. And so my boss has kind of really got the the tech guys and the IT guys. Uh, he's really sort of got in and rattled their cage and gone, listen, I want – because the thing is Leah runs Pro Tools, but Greg and I, we're both running Nuendo. And the, the problem is when Leah goes away, like if she has a day off – Neither Greg nor I have got a clue about how to find anything on her system because we we don't use Mac, we don't use Pro Tools. So my boss has said, look, you know, I want the, the boys upgraded to Pro Tools and Macs and I want it to happen in the next six weeks, you know. So they've gone ahead and they've taken the PC out of Control Room 3 and put in this brand new 27-inch iMac with Pro Tools 11. And... There were some things about the way that control room was wired up that nobody else had a clue about in the technical department because the guys who were or the guy who was involved in wiring a lot of that up no longer works in the company. So I was helping the tech guys deploy this Mac, at least on a level of getting it to interface with the gear that's in the studio, because I at least understand some of how that studio is wired up. So I was in there on Tuesday. Now, this week just gone, of course, was a four-day week because we were leading up to Easter. And for radio production, guys, this is one of the two busiest weeks of the year. You know, the week prior to Easter and the week prior to Christmas are just manic. So I'm in there on Tuesday morning with the IT guys helping them, you know, set up this iMac. And my boss walks in and goes, this is now your new studio. And I went, oh. Okay. And uh, so he basically, you know, said, you know, as soon as you want to move in here, move in. Now, admittedly, it was my decision. I just went, oh, well, stuff it. I'll move in right now. But I should have perhaps thought through what the remainder of the week was going to be like work wise before I made that decision. But the IT guys came and moved my, my office PC from control room two into control room three for me. And basically got enough set up that by the time I realized, wow, this is going to be a really busy week to be thrown in at the deep end on a new operating system, because I've never used Mac OS, and to be trying to teach myself how to run Pro Tools, this was probably not the smartest move to make. But I'm very much of the opinion, you only learn by doing, and you might as well just dive in head first, rip the Band-Aid off in one go, you know. <laughs> so that made for a very manic week, and... Uh, as a, as a consequence, like I said, I, I didn't get to do any stereo miking samples. So we shall leave stereo miking for another episode. But Doc, you wanted to talk a little bit more about mic preamps before we, we moved on to today's topic. What, what did you want to cover? Well, I don't want to belabor it too much, but uh, I saw an email from one of the listeners that was mm-hmm. confusing uh, the mic transformer that I was talking about, thinking it was part of the power supply, and it's not. It's the microphone input transformer in the preamp. It's what the microphone sees directly. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the power supply, whether it be a remote power supply, which some people have, or if it's in the chassis with everything else. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clear. And uh, I had a couple of links I wanted to share with people. Sure. Which uh, we've talked about in the past, but one of those links would be thatcorporation.com. Yep. And they make really good integrated circuit-based mic preamps, like the 1510 and 1512. Okay. And they also make line drivers, like the 1600 series line drivers, which are very good. So are these completed components that someone would buy for their project studio, or are these bits that you would buy in order to build your own components? These are bits that you would buy to build your own preamp. Right, okay. <laughs> so it's a little bit of fun, right? Yeah, yeah um, for sure. I, and I know I've got a lot of friends who would say, hey, discrete is the only way to go, or even tubes is the only way to go. And, you know, that's all good, but I think that it's possible to get where you want to go using an integrated circuit if it's properly designed and used properly. Yep. In other words, I wouldn't drive uh, an integrated circuit past its power supply, uh, available power supply, like yep. a lot of audios, plus or minus 15 volts, and people refer to that as the rails of the supply. So if you're quote unquote rails or 15 volts and minus 15 volts, you wouldn't want to try to drive a signal in there that was so loud that it would look for more voltage than that because then you would get clipping because right. you're going past the rails. Yep. So as far as discrete circuits are concerned, 
John Hardy, johnhardyco.com, I think is his website. Yep. He makes the 990 preamp that Dean Tension designed years ago, and it's just fantastic. And he talks about, he's got a circuit diagram that shows it being used with the Jensen JE16 transformer. You really can't do better than that combination in terms of a transformer-based mic preamp. And I just wanted to put that as a shout out. But mainly I wanted to answer the question about the confusion regarding transformers in the power supply versus the mic transformer that I was talking about. So yes, a power supply is going to have a transformer, but that's a totally different thing. It's got nothing to do with the conversation, really. Okay, cool. So I must admit, all of this stuff is completely new territory to me. I've been reading up about transformers in the last couple of days and trying to understand how they work. My understanding is you essentially have two coils of wire, which don't physically touch each other and a voltage and current is driven into one coil and induces a current and voltage in the other coil and the number of windings, what they refer to as the windings, which is the number of times the the wire is wound around into a coil on either side of the transformer will dictate how the output side relates to the input side. So if there's the same number of windings on both sides of the transformer, you've got a one-to-one transfer. So the whatever voltage and current is exhibited on the first side, or what's known as the primary side of the transformer, will also be exhibited on the secondary side of the transformer, which is the output side. But if the output side, the secondary, only has half as many coils in, in the windings of the wire then the output will differ by a ratio of two to one from the input. Is that right, Doc? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. So you could have a step-up transformer or a step-down. It's a good way to match impedance. So so which way way does it go? If you you want it to step up, is it more more windings on the secondary side? Exactly. Right. And if you want it to step down, you have half as many windings or whatever ratio. Yeah. And then there's different uh, core materials. Uh, some transformers have a steel core, other trans, you know, where the wire coils are wrapped around the steel. Right. Some have nickel. Yep. Like the, like the Jensen transformer I mentioned earlier has a nickel core, which is more linear, meaning that it, it sounds more exactly like what the input sounds like. Yeah. See, I've, I've come across references to transformers introducing color to the sound in yes. what in what way does it do that well it's kind of hard to explain it but for example <laughs> as you know i'm using an api mic preamp right now yep and the api mic preamp has two transformers it's got an input transformer and an output transformer and these are both steel core uh, meaning that it's not quite as linear but it's also less money but it sounds really great to me I wouldn't use a word like distortion because that's much too strong of a word, but it is a little bit less linear. Right. I hear it as kind of a forward mid-range, okay. but, it, but it doesn't measure that way. It just sounds that way. It's, kind of, it's difficult okay. to explain, but, but uh, for those of you who are really into really wanting your transformer to sound like it's not there, but you still get the isolation advantages of a transformer for grounding purposes or any purposes, then uh, nickel core makes more sense but it's more money so right but yes you're right yeah one of one of the things that i did read about transformers was that what they do very well is remove any dc component from the audio signal because there is this isolation which occurs between the the primary and the secondary of of a transformer if there's any direct current in that signal it will not be able to jump across induction. Well, that's absolutely true. That's totally true. Right, and that and you get complete isolation that way. So it works. It works really great. Even phantom power can't jump across, for example. Right. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. I, I'm keen to learn more about this stuff, but I don't have any gear myself that is transformer driven. I do have a compressor, uh, which I've mentioned to the listeners on this podcast in the past, which is made by a company who unfortunately have gone out of business. They were a little boutique company in the UK called Safe Sound Audio. And the compressor is called the Dynamics Toolbox. And it's a beautiful compressor. It um, can run as dual mono or stereo. And by default, when you buy it, it comes with solid state 
output. But there are a second set of jacks for a transformer output. But in order to get the transformer output uh, functioning on this compressor, you had to buy a pair of small, almost like daughter boards, uh, which were like a printed circuit board with a couple of connectors uh, on each end. And basically you can open up this compressor and you'll see that there are slots where these daughter boards slot in. And the idea was you'd buy these daughter boards with one of, there were three different companies that were making uh, this board specifically for this compressor. There was a, a Lundahl, uh, a, a, I think it was pronounced Stoll, uh, and there was one other. I can't remember what the other one was. Uh, but because this company's now gone out of business, you can't buy those Transformer daughter boards anymore, which is kind of a shame because I'd love to experiment. But <laughs> Well, I feel like, you know, I always hate to hear about an audio company going under like that. I, I hate to hear that. Yeah. I really do. Uh, as far as Lundahl is concerned, they make a high-quality product. I know that Rupert Neve is using or has used in the past and I think still uses the 1538 as a mic preamp transformer, and there's a lot of equipment out there that's uh, using that uh, mic transformer, and it works right. very well. Yeah, right. All right. Well, look, um, I feel like I'm a little out of my depth on this conversation, so... <laughs> <laughs> and conscious of uh, some of our listeners will might be their eyes might be glazing over, so I don't want to get right. too, too deep into that. But what I thought was possibly a, a good transition from the last couple of podcasts and what we've discussed, you know, with microphones and mic preamps, would maybe be a discussion about microphone technique, not only for voiceover work, but also you know for miking instruments and and things like that. And I thought that probably the a, good place to start would be talking about microphones which are either side address or end address. Yes. Now, the majority of, to the best of my knowledge, all your figure eight microphones are side address, uh, meaning yeah. that you address the side of the microphone. You don't talk into the end of it, you talk into the side of it. And most uh, high quality, you know, large diaphragm condenser mics, things like your Neumann U87, most of those Audio Technica, you know, 40 series microphones, things like your AKG C414, they are all what you would call a side address microphone, meaning you speak into the side of them. Right. Although there's a lot of small diaphragm condenser mics that have a smaller diaphragm, like an inch or less. And those are often end address, like, for example, a Neumann KM-184, which is a mic I use a lot, yep. or the KM-84, which is an older version of the same mic, which has different electronics but and sounds slightly different, but, it, but they're both excellent mics. And, and, you know, C-451s by AKG. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you know, and Rode, uh, in your part of the world, yep. makes a lot of very good microphones, in my opinion, for the money. They that do. Uh, that, uh, and I, in fact, I own seven. Road mics. Wow. You know, so I could be an ad for them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the big ones, like the 2000s that I have, uh, those are, uh, notice I'm talking plural, those are side address. Yep. Whereas they make a mic that's pretty much like a KM184, that is a, a end address microphone. Right. And as you know, there's lots of dynamic mics that look like they're end address, even though they're not, which has given me no end of happiness and laughter. So... <laughs> so I guess some examples of end address microphones would be pretty much any handheld microphone you see a performer using on stage. You know, that can be anything like your Shaw, you know, 57s, 58s. From a broadcast point of view, things like the Shaw SM7B uh, is an end address mic. The venerable Electrovoice RE20, which has been around for a million years and is just a great dynamic voiceover mic and quite often used in broadcast, again, is an end address microphone. Yes, it's a, that is really a great mic. And uh, at the college, we have three of them. And they work well for a variety of things. They're great on kick drum, for example, because yeah. they have a flat, low-end frequency response. Yep. And they're great if you're in a situation where you want to cut back on leakage where they're not as sensitive as a condenser mic would be. Yeah. And that means that you don't have as much leakage. But those are great mics for voiceover. Uh, they're great mics for a lot of things. And they're not bad on brass. Uh, they sound really pretty right. good on, tr on trombones, uh, euphonium, trumpets, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Now, did you say to me that you've actually seen people addressing RE20s as side address? I said that. It was the funniest thing you ever saw. <laughs> Because they have all those, you know, the RE20 has all those slots on the side. Exactly. You know, it takes up a lot of area. So people who are just learning see that mic and think that, oh, well, it, okay, it's like a condenser. <laughs> you talk into the side, you know, and I've caught people doing that, you know, when they're just starting out. Yeah. And uh, there's also that, you know, the Sennheiser MD421 yep. is an end address microphone, but some people think it's a side address because it's got that little band of metal right across the tip of the mic. Right. And that's a fantastic microphone. It's great on oh. guitar amps, yep. trumpets, you know, brass, anything like that. It's just timpani even. I've, I've, yeah, I was, I was about to say, I've used it on toms on a drum kit, and it's beautiful for toms. Oh, I use it for that a lot, even though... It does have a low-end roll-off even when the M switch is engaged, meaning that it's got a rotary switch on the microphone right around where the uh, Canon connector plugs in, the XLR. Okay. And it's got an M on one side and an S on the other, and then graduated markings in between. And the M is the flattest response, and the S, as you go toward the S, you get more uh, low-frequency roll-off, so it becomes a high-pass filter. Wow. And... Even when that microphone is all the way to M, it still has a little bit of roll off in the bottom end. And yet, it still sounds good on timpani and stuff like that. Although it wouldn't be my first choice for a bass amp, it would work in a storm. Yeah, right. Know. Yep. But it's, it's fantastic on Tom Toms, absolutely. Yeah, right. I, to be honest, the only time that I did get to use them uh, on a drum kit was much, much earlier in my career when I knew way less about what I was doing. And to be honest, I was not even aware that there was that rotary collar around the XLR connector. Uh, so I have no idea what position that was in when I used them, but uh, I know that they did the job very well. So Yes, well, I had my share of blind luck when I was starting out. <laughs> no question about it. I, th I think that's just the, the nature of the beast. You know, the longer you're in the industry, the more you look back at things you did in your early days and go, oh my God, how did I end up keeping my job? <laughs> <laughs> Sennheiser also makes another microphone called the 441, which is really a good mic. Okay. You may have seen it. Stevie Nicks uses it a lot for live performance. Okay. It's this long, kind of squared off microphone. It's also a fantastic mic where you want a good quality sound, but you don't want a condenser. And uh, it's great for vocals, but it's also another good microphone for brass, uh, trumpets, and that sort of thing. Right. So that's, again, that's designed as an end address mic? It is. Yeah, right. I can imagine that is another one that could easily confuse newbies. Yes. Because yes. the grill on it goes right down the sides of it, so you could very easily, you know, if you didn't know better, confuse it with being a side address microphone. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so in terms of technique, Something I wanted to cover in the in this discussion, and this was brought about by a recording session that happened earlier this week, where I was uh, recording here in Australia. The Australian Radio Network owns the rights to the iHeart brand for this region, and one of our uh, iHeart stations, if you like, digitally, is iHeart Country Australia, and we were pre-recording. An interview uh, which was going to or will go to air in the next couple of weeks uh, with a, a music artist from the Australian country music scene and our regular host Amber and I put Amber on the SE 2200A which is a large diaphragm condenser and I put the the guest artist on the U87 which is again a large diaphragm condenser and I'd put his chair where I wanted him to sit in the booth and I'd set the mic up and I'd walked back into the control room to grab a piece of paper or something. And when I came back, I noticed he'd he'd rotated the chair around and he was facing directly at the U87. And I said to him, I said, what I want you to do is just rotate your chair back around so you're facing Amber. And I want you to work past the side of the microphone. So have this U87 sort of at a 45 degree angle out from your mouth, but you're talking straight past the front of it. And he looked at me and he said, okay, I'm going to ask a stupid question. And I said, okay. He said, why would I speak past the front of it? And I said, because when we speak, the majority of the air velocity coming out of our mouth 
travels straight out in a direct line, even though a microphone can hear you from, you know, that whole 180 degree arc around the front of your face. When you speak straight into a microphone like that, there is a higher propensity for you to pop, you know, or as I said, the, you know, the correct terminology is a plosive, where that gust of air leaving your mouth causes an overload of the diaphragm and you get that nasty p sound, you know. And he went, wow, he said, you learn something every day. He said, I always have trouble with that when we're recording in the studio. He said, and we've got socks and, you know, pop filters and all sorts of rubbish in front of the microphone. He said, and I still have trouble with it. And I said, well, give this a go and see, see how you go. And, and so we went through this entire half hour interview and he didn't pop once. And he was absolutely blown away. At the, the, no one had ever brought that to his attention. And I thought... Is this one of those arcane pieces of knowledge that just us audio engineers know about and most people have no concept and so everyone just thinks that they should talk straight into the microphone? I think it is. I think it is some of the arcane mystery knowledge of the magic engineers. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it certainly does work. Now, uh, I will admit to not using that technique all that often, but yes, it's totally valid to do that because you're not speaking into the side of the mic. You're still speaking into the front of it. You're yeah. just doing it from an angle. That's yeah. all. Absolutely. I, I, it's I, not even, like you're talking into the metal seam around the grill plate of the mic. You know, you're not doing that. No. I mean, as I record these podcasts, I have my R84 sitting about six to eight inches away from me and like I said, at about a 45 degree angle. And I, I sit facing my computer monitor. So the majority of the air leaving my mouth is going straight towards the monitor, which is sort of past the front of my, my ribbon mic. Because this mic, it can be very uh, sensitive to plosives. I've noticed it once or twice, you know, that they've you know, if I, if I get excited and I turn my head towards the mic like this, you know, and I, and I happen to have a word with a P or a T, you know, it can pop. And sometimes I've had to correct that in post-production. So I'm, I'm always very conscious of that and try and keep my face pointed at the computer monitor. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting. No, and yet the irony here yeah. is that I'm facing directly into my microphone, but I am using a pop filter and I have a high pass filter on the mic. Right. So, you know, you mentioned fixing a pop or a plosive in post-production. Yep. Maybe somebody out there would like to know what you mean by that, how you would fix it. <laughs> Do you know, I, uh, yes, I will absolutely address that. And I'll, I want to share a little anecdote. The very first time I was exposed to a digital audio workstation, I was down in Hobart in Tasmania. It was 19... 90 or 91 it's probably 1990 and it was pro tools 3 oh oh, oh, oh. <laughs> your skin's crawling isn't it mate <laughs> well i promise the converters are pretty good now compared yeah, to that okay. yeah exactly but here, here was the thing I, this was a completely foreign concept to anyone who had grown up on tape right and the guy who was demoing it he was trying to sell Pro Tools in Tasmania. And so he'd contacted the radio station and said, listen, you know, I want to bring this system in and show it to your production guys. And and so the company had said, yeah, sure, bring it in, demo it by all means. You know, it doesn't mean we, we're going to say yes. But so he's brought this thing in and we've hooked it up. And, and I was very excited, you know, because there was talk at the time of, you know, digital audio taking over. And I was one of those, you know, complete Luddites who thought, oh, no, no, I'm in a career that'll never be overtaken by computers. You know, how are you ever going to do what we do on tape in a computer? And oh. <laughs> so anyway, he's come in and to demo this thing. And, you know, he showed me, you know, recording of a voice track. And, and I had a voice talent in the booth doing a commercial for me. And we recorded this voice track. And I'm going, oh, wow, that's great, you know. And then he's hit record again. And I see all of the waveforms disappearing under this new recording. And I'm like, ah! And he said, no, 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 it's cool. It's still there. And I'm like, no, I know what happens on tape. If you record over it, it's gone. And, oh. and, and of course, then he, you know, he presses stop and he goes, no, we get rid of that. And then we grab the edge of this and we pull it back out and there's the recording. And I'm like, 
what kind of skullduggery and you know magic is this? You know, it's not. It's called non-destructive recording. Exactly. You, know, you still have the recording on the hard drive, but the edit decision list that you're creating, or the waveforms on the screen, are a reflection of those sound waves. You're not actually cutting the exactly. recorded sound wave. So it's uh, it's a great thing for the <laughs> students to learn. You know? Yeah, totally. So. Anyway, a day later, he's he, he's gone. You know, he's he's shown us how to work it, and he's left. And he he said, "I'm going to leave this with you for a week." And I was like, "Okay, cool." And the next day, I had uh, one of our breakfast announcers come in, and he had to do this quite complicated vocal performance that was half singing, half talking, and he absolutely nailed it in the very first take. But there was one massive, well, not massive, but there was a decent plosive halfway through the performance. And we did another couple of takes, and I got another performance that was free of plosives, and I let him go. And then when I listened back to it, I thought, ah, it's free of plosives, but it didn't quite have the magic that that very first take had. And so I thought to myself, surely with all this, you know, wonderful technology that's in this magic box, there's got to be something that can be done. And at the time, I understood enough. I understood the use of a high pass filter. So what I did was I went in and I split the voice track on either side of where this plosive was. And then I you know, dragged the edges out so that we had a couple of quick crossfades. So what had become or what had started as one clip of audio was now three clips of audio where this middle clip was just the, you know, only a half second long over the, where the plosive was in the recording. And what I did was I then applied a high pass filter at around uh, probably 120 Hertz or something like that, just on that, middle clip and with that and then a little bit of volume automation as well uh, just to dip the the volume during that half second I was actually able to remove this plosive from the recording and and it was still marginally noticeable but I recognized that once I got the music in behind it it was going to be completely invisible and sure enough once I put the music in and I mixed it all off it was a flawless performance with no plosive and it had all that, you know, energy and excitement that I got out of that first take. And man, I walked around the building for days telling anybody who would listen just how amazing this technology was. Yeah, because in the days of recording to tape, you get a plosive, you're stuck with it. Right. You, you can only go so far with an equalizer or a dip filter or whatever. Well, you don't have automation. So, you know, trying to get you know, that high pass filter to just kick in and kick out within a half second, you can't do that in the analog realm without some kind of automation. You, you know, the, physically, you just can't push buttons fast enough. Right. So, you know, that was one of the things that I, you know, loved right from my very first interactions with any digital audio workstation was just how much you could you know treat plosives in post i mean obviously you know i certainly live by the ethos of try and get the performance absolutely correct at the microphone you know but sometimes like this you you end up with what is ostensibly a killer performance but you do end up with a plosive in there and in those instances you just have to say well I'd, I'd keep the killer performance with its one one or two plosives that were unavoidable rather than take a substandard performance which was free of plosives. You know, I'd rather use the technology at my disposal and try and deal with those pops, you know, using technology rather than sacrifice what was otherwise a great performance. Well, I totally agree. And also you can get to a point where in looking for engineering perfection, you can burn out the performer Oh, totally. And things just, start, this, things just start getting worse instead of better, and then they get frustrated, and then the whole thing goes down. So get the one that sounds like it's got the best performance, and then you can manipulate it later to be technically yeah. you know, there. Exactly. So, yes. 
So I guess that sort of, you know, brings it round in a, in a long way to what I was saying about technique. You know, when it comes to voiceover stuff, if you find you know, that you're recording a podcast or you're recording a, a, a performer either as a singer or as just a, a spoken word vocalist, be conscious of those pops because they they can really distract the listener. If you let them go through into the final product and you don't deal with them somehow, they can be a real distraction. Right. Whether it's in a, a, a song, you know, sung, or it's just a spoken word piece, it can really pull the listener away from whatever that you know, recorded work is meant to be doing, whether it's exciting them through music or informing them through spoken word. You know, leaving those pops in can really distract your listener. Oh, absolutely. And it makes your recording sound like amateur night. You it don't does. want that. It does. You know? Absolutely. So, so for, for vocal stuff, I always get my voice talent to work across the mic. I you know, pretty much never have them speaking straight into the side of a side address mic or even into the end of an end address mic. I will always set the microphone up at a 45 degree angle to their to their mouth. So, you know, if they've got a lectern in front of them and they've got a script on the lectern, I'll tell them, just face the lectern. Keep keep your vo- you know, your mouth and your eyes pointed at the lectern and I'll put the microphone where I want it and you don't need to worry about it, you know. And yeah, I've never had voice artists say that they are uncomfortable with the mic at the side or anything like that. And I always end up with a a great performance and and no plosives. So just wanted to share that. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's good advice. It's good advice, especially for dialogue and spoken word. Absolutely. In your time, uh, in your former life, when you were witnessing ADR, did you ever see people uh, using that approach or did they generally work straight onto the mic or? Well, I remember, uh, I remember a lot of ADR sessions, and it was it was it was very rare that somebody actually used that technique. I remember one show, uh, and this is start, this is kind of a new thing in ADR, but the producers would come in and actually try a bunch of different microphones and choose the one they liked the best, which never used to happen in ADR ever. Right. But in today's world, it's beginning to happen. So this one show would use uh, a Neumann one hundred and three, right, for the main mic, and they put the actor about. A foot away from him, but they'd also have like a Sennheiser 416, you know, uh, yeah. three or four feet back to get more of an ambient sound on it. And right. that was that was that was not unusual to do that, even though those were not the type of mics that were used on the set. You know, there is a school of thought that says that whatever mic you use on the set is what you should use in ADR. Uh, but that there's so much different in ADR because you're in a controlled studio versus a set. It actually doesn't work as well as you would think to do that. So you're better off using the mic that gets the best sound in the uh, ADR stage. So, for example, we had a woman who would do a voiceover on a one-hour television show, and she always used a microphone that you don't see very often, a U89. Oh, okay. Which looks like a U87, but it's physically smaller. Yeah. Sounds completely different than a U87. It's a good-sounding mic, but it's not used all that often. But... You know, for her voiceover, uh, she played a character that was dead, and you were hearing the character, the dead character, sort of narrate the show. Yeah, and uh, it sounded really good. Sounded really good. In fact, she went to another TV show after the one got canceled and bought one of those microphones herself. So right. So I'm I'm glad you addressed that whole school of thought of whatever mic you use on set you should use for the ADR because that was exactly what I was thinking when you were saying, you know, they, they would use a, a TLM-103 and, and a 416 a bit further back because I was thinking, wouldn't you want to use the same mic you recorded on set with? So surely- But it might be, but the mic they use on set might be some lavalier omni mic that's buried under their necktie or in yep. their shirt somewhere, yep. right? So it, it just doesn't, always work out. Although we did have on the ADR stage, we had three of them. We always had a lavalier in case it was needed and they'd use it once in a while, but most of the time, no. Right. So what I'm wondering though, is when you get into ADR and suddenly you're using, you know, a gorgeous large diaphragm condenser, like a TLM-103, surely that's going to have a completely different sonic footprint to 
either the lav or the boom mics that we used on set. So is there extensive EQ required in order to get the ADR to match the set sound? There is. And uh, well, for, look, even if you use the same exact microphone that they had on the set, it's still going to sound massively different because the environment is so different. Yeah. So it's going to sound different anyway. So the answer to your question is yes. You know, the best dialogue mixers can make ADR sound really good and really yep. degrade the sound to sound more like what's coming off the set or what we call production dialogue. Yep. It's it's just it's an that's an art unto itself. Totally. And I know that I've seen some TV shows where I've, you know, been watching a scene and suddenly gone, "Whoa, that last line was ADR because it stood out like dog's nuts you know <laughs> it just you could really tell that it was not part of the original performance you know well you know okay so adr in the hands of a bad dialogue mixer or a mixer that has no time because yep. they have no budget yep uh, that can be a problem but what also can make adr sound bad is when they decide to change the words coming out of the actor's mouth oh <laughs> yeah right and that happens more often than you would think. Really? So you try to play tricks on it. Like uh, you can, you know, you can always make sure you're in sync if the actor's back is to the camera when you put the ADR line in there. Sure. But if the actor is dead on screen and they want to change what the actor said, uh, wow. maybe they're doing a cl maybe they're doing a clean language airline version of a movie, sure. you know, or. Or maybe they change in the dialogue because they're making a plot point that they didn't think of when they wrote the show. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you would do that. And that ADR, that's hard to deal with. Or it could be you're doing a foreign language version and then all right. bets are off. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd imagine with foreign language, you, you can't uh, control the length of words that need to be substituted. Right. Well, you know, in an airline, I'm sorry, in a foreign version... If they're doing this foreign dialogue in country, say it's, they're doing a Castilian Spanish version and they're in Spain, something like that, yeah, they would get sent what's called a filled foreign, and that is a track that has all of the music and all of the sound effects from the original domestic mix, and then all they have to do is add the dialogue to it, and they're good to go. It's got the foley already yeah. there to make up for what was lost on the set. It's, that's why they call it a filled foreign, because they take the music and effects track and add some extra foley to it, and then they can send that all around the world and do all these languages, and it still has the our same artistic intent right. as the original. Yeah. I, here in Australia, I'd heard that referred to as a full M&E mix. Yes. But I, I guess that's the same thing. Yeah, you have an M&E, which is not filled with the extra foley, and then you have the filled foreign, which is the M&E plus a few extra little tracks oh. because there's no production effects added at that point. Right, okay. Yeah, interesting. All right. Uh, so to bring, to bring this back to microphone technique. Yes, that's where we were. That's yes, where we were. mic technique. <laughs> that's where we were. Miking of <laughs> instruments. Do you have any pet peeves or any uh, must-employ techniques for various instruments? Well, uh, one way to get fired off a show is to blow into a ribbon mic. <laughs> Has that happened to you? Uh, no, but, you know, I warn people, do not do that. Do not blow into a microphone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, mic technique is so dependent on what you're going for and what instrument you're miking and what the situation is. You know, for example, you might use a stereo pair in a room with perfect acoustics yeah. on an orchestra. But if you have that same orchestra in a room that the acoustics aren't perfect, then you have to also use spot mics to make up for the fact that the acoustics aren't perfect. And then you have to balance those. One thing I will say about that that I, I think most people don't think about, uh, and let's, it's the, same, the same is true for drum overheads as it is for orchestral miking. Yep. If you have an XY pair, and we'll talk more about ver versions of stereo miking in the future show, sure. obviously. Yeah. But if you have an XY pair, and when you put that up, you hear, say, for example, the violas coming out of mm, 31 degrees from the hard left of that, and you also have a spot mic on those, you better pan them to the same place that you hear it in the XY, or you're going to get this weird, very subtle, but strange image smearing thing going on 
that maybe the untrained ear might not hear it, but it'll detract from the clarity of the performance in a way that most people won't really be able to put it into words, but it'll just not sound as natural as it could. So yeah, the right. same thing is true for if you have a drum set and you've got and you're using left and right overheads, but you also have a snare mic and a hi-hat mic and tom mics and all this stuff, you need to make sure that however wide you pan your left and right overheads, that you take into account where you hear the other drums coming from so you can pan your spot mics to the same location. And that really helps your stereo imaging and can make the difference between something that sounds really high fidelity and something that sounds okay. Wow, that that is really interesting. I'd never heard that expressed in that way. And that actually makes a whole lot of sense Uh, and not something that I'd ever considered when I'd been mixing live drums. I will definitely be remembering that. That's That's an interesting one. I will admit that I am uh, I haven't heard anybody else talk about it either. Right. But it's just something that I came up with many years ago and it and uh, I just think it works. When you express it the way you just have, it makes total sense. <laughs> well, you know, I can bullshit with the best of them. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I, I don't. We, we could spend hours talking about how to mic every different instrument there is. Well, let me ask you a question. If you, if you had French horns that you were miking, and you know French horns, just as an example, I'm yeah. just picking them out They're of the They're the air. circular ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they have the bell pointed toward the back. So where would you put the mic? Would you put the mic in front of the French horn players like every other mic is in the room? Or would you put it behind them? And if you did put it behind them, when you flip it, would you flip the polarity 180 degrees because the mic is aimed forward where every other mic is aimed toward the back of the room? These are things to think about as well. That's a great question. In terms of placement of the mic, I would absolutely use my ears. I would walk around the player and go, at what point, you know, in this 360 degrees circumference around the player, do I get the truest tone of the instrument they're playing? And Absolutely. That would be the point at which I'd place the microphone. And I agree, not, and you'd also and want to not, see how it sounds with everything else too. And know? it's and it, oh, yeah, okay, I'll come back to that. Uh, it's, uh, it would not always be at head height either. You know, sometimes you've got to crouch down and and do another three hundred and sixty degree. You know, <laughs> walk around them, even if it is a duck waddle. And have a listen to how that instrument sounds at every angle, at every height. And, you know, work out where, where is it that this instrument sounds truest in tone. And that would be the point at which I'd put my microphone. I'd, I'd do that when I'm miking an electric guitar cabinet. I'll tell the guitarist, you know, okay, just give me something, but don't blast my head off. But, you know, give me something so I can hear the tone of the amplifier. And I'll actually get down on all fours and move my head around in front of that amp and and completely off axis and then right on axis and up close and then slowly work further and further away from it. And I use that approach every time I mic an electric guitar cabinet because every cabinet's different, every guitar's different, the pedals that they're using, all those things will impart different characters into the tone of the signal and all of those things will change where the real meat of that sound will develop in terms of three-dimensional space from the front of the amp. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And also, if it's an amp that has multiple speakers in it, you might find that uh, going on axis to the cone of one speaker sounds different than a different speaker. That can happen. Yeah. uh, For example, suppose a guitar player decides that he wants to put a different speaker one different speaker in his amp and say he's got a super reverb and he's got four 10 inch speakers in there, for example, or he's got a Marshall stack and he's got four 12s and he's decided to change two of the four 12s to what are called greenback Celestians, which is a type of speaker. Those are going to sound different than what the amp had originally. So then you have to even get more granular and figure out uh, which speaker to mic. Yeah, for sure. So, so that happens. You asked a question a couple of minutes ago when we were talking about French horns and I said I'd come back to it. What, what was it you asked? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so there's that movie about the fish that's got the short-term memory loss. What is that thing called? 
<laughs> I probably asked you if you'd put the mic in front of the uh, French horns or behind the French you horns. You did ask the about that flipped. and then about the polarity switch. And that and yes. that's a great, great point. I had not even considered that. But Another place to try the polarity switch is if you mic both the top and bottom of the snare drum. Oh, definitely. You know, you're going to want to throw the polarity switch on the bottom mic. Yeah. And all this needs to be checked in mono, by the way. Definitely. A lot of people, especially in today's world, record more tracks than they need to because people can't make a decision anymore. Yes. Uh, they have all this endless tracks freedom. <laughs> and people forget to check mono. And I had an artist here in my home studio uh, about a month ago mm. who was playing a mix for me done by somebody else. And there was one song where they had stereo acoustic guitar and it completely disappeared in mono. Oh, no. So I said, you know, it sounds really great in stereo, but what happens if it's playing at Walmart? Yeah. And it's only coming out in mono and the, there's no acoustic guitar. It's going to sound like an acapella vocal with drums. Yeah. And it hadn't occurred to, to them that that's a problem. So yeah. Even in today's world of high tech, blah, 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 you yeah. still need to check mono to Definitely. make sure that it's okay. Definitely. Uh, it's interesting, you know, you talk about recording too many tracks. Uh, it reminds me of two things. One, the uh, second episode of the Tape Hop podcast where they, uh, he's talking to, or was it the third episode where he's talking to Jack White of the White Stripes? Uh, and he talks about using tape because it prevents you from committing, you know, way too many ideas to to tape and then being lost in, you know, not being able to make a decision. Uh, and right. it also reminds me of Sir George Martin, who said that, was, was, it, was it George Martin or was it Jeff Emmerich, was saying that when it came to mixing the songs that the Beatles had tracked, he would always take the approach of what's the fewest number of, tracks that have been recorded that I can use in the mix and still make the song work. And I thought, what a great mindset, you know. That, that, well, that, because that, nowadays you get engineers who will record a guitar overdub and they'll have an on-axis, they'll have three mics on axis, and then they'll have five <laughs> mics around the room. You know, they'll have a mic in a live spot and a mic in a dead spot and they'll have a an omnidirectional across the hall and all this stuff, you know? Yep. And so when you go to mix this thing, you've got a bazillion tracks and they forget to label them what they are. So you have a bunch of audio <laughs> one, audio two, <laughs> audio three. Yeah. You know, which is a pet peeve of mine. Oh, totally. Totally. And, and uh, they forget to put anything in the comments field. So I, I just, just let me find the one track and dump all the rest of this crap. Yeah. But th I mean, that, that refers to multiple mics for a single performance, but I'm talking about where there's multiple performances. You know, I, I yeah. work with an artist regularly who has a tendency to track, you know, seven, eight guitar parts. And then he'll just say to me, I'll oh, use whatever you reckon works in the mix. <laughs> It's like, oh, <laughs> man, really? <laughs> Sometimes that just becomes a nightmare of its own, you know, because you're trying to work through all these guitar parts and think, okay, which ones work on their own? Which ones work together? Which ones don't work together? Uh, and then you, you're trying to work out, okay, I'll use this guitar for this part and I'll use those couple of guitars for that part. And uh, it can become a nightmare, you know, where... Well, that's, that's what can happen when you're not thinking like an arranger. And you're thinking yeah. more like, I can play this part and I can play that part, but you're not looking at the big picture of the song. Yeah, right. And this person that you record has a lot of company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yes. I can, I can imagine. I can imagine. Uh, look, Doc, we could talk about this stuff for weeks, but uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up, shall we? Sure, okay. Uh, was there anything that you wanted to cover that we haven't covered so far? Uh, no, but I'll wait for the questions to come. I hope I cleared up the issue about the power supply transformer as opposed to the microphone input transformer. For sure. And uh, I'm sure I confuse everybody with all, all the other stuff that I blabbered <laughs> about today. But, uh, you know, we look at the emails, and I'm happy to answer any question that I can, absolutely. Beautiful. All right, Doc, we'll talk with you in a couple of weeks. Talk to you then. <laughs> Bye. Sign language. Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com. <laughs>